We only need to travel a few miles west of Elko to find the California Trail Interpretive Center. It's an impressive facility with a lot to look at, even before you go inside. Alex Rose is the park ranger at the center. Alex, thank you so much for meeting us here. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. So someone like myself who's not as familiar with the California Trail as I am with the Oregon Trail, what is the California Trail? Well, the California Trail is a 2,000 mile trail that stretches from the Missouri River all the way past the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. And this is where 250,000 people, uh, men, women, and children, left their family and friends back east and took this trail to reach California. The goal was to cross the Sierra Nevada mountains uh, before the snows hit. And they had to cross the Great Salt Lake Flax in Utah. Uh, they had to wrap around the Ruby Mountains here in Nevada, and it really slowed them down during their journey. And the stories we hear are about those people who couldn't make it. Exactly. When visitors come to this site, they can learn about the pioneer story, and then they can leave here um, and hopefully be inspired to overcome whatever obstacles they face in their lives. This is a place for inspiration. Oh, that sounds good. I want to go look. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Alex, I didn't expect to see an elephant in a pioneer <laughs> exhibit. What is this? Well, in the journals and the diaries of the immigrants, you would see this expression, uh, I've seen the elephant. Imagine being a pioneer in your back east and seeing an elephant for the first time. You've never seen it, obviously, on television right. or a magazine or a book, and here you are seeing this magnificent mm. beast. How would you describe it? You know, you see the expression on that man's face. Yeah. And you see the bones on the ground. And uh, this is a good metaphor for describing the pioneer experience. This is so cool. I've always wondered what a wagon loaded for travel would look like. We know a wagon is the ultimate symbol of the pioneer experience. And for most of the pioneers, wagons were indispensable for the journey. And this is an example of what the pioneers would have brought with them for a four month journey. We have an example of a barrel of bacon that you would need to bring with you, um, a butter churner, coffee, beans, so there's so many different things that you would need for your journey and to sustain you for your journey. What occurs to me is where do you put the family? Where do you put the family? <laughs> Excellent question. Well, you know, most people actually walked to California. Wow. You know, some folks might think they rode in the, in the wagons, but very few immigrants actually rode in the wagons. Perhaps if you were you know, a pregnant woman or a small child, you, you might get a ride in the wagon, but most people walked. Looks like they did have some fun when they were yes, out they did. on the trail. You know, it, you walk through here and I kind of put some of the family members that I know were immigrants that moved across the country into these roles. It's funny. <laughs> Who's that? Oh, that would be my great, great grandma. <laughs> <laughs> With it being such a difficult trail, did immigrants die along the way? Yes, there were folks that died of cholera and other diseases. So there were certainly immigrants that died along the way. But, and this is what's amazing, 94% of the Im immigrants actually made it to their destination, 94%. I would never have guessed that. Yeah, I would percentage. have thought it was a much lower percentage. It's amazing, most of the immigrants made it. And this is a real testament to the human ability to adapt and overcome obstacles. Now I know part of the story of the trail involved the Native Americans that were already in the area. So were there conflicts between the pioneers and the Native Americans? Yes, there were conflicts because there was a lot of mistrust on both sides. And so um, the Native Americans, they are very dependent in particular on rivers for, for sources of food, ducks, fish, game that came down to the rivers. The issue was you had the California Trail was right along the Humboldt River, 
which was also important because it was used as food sources for the Native Americans. So you had a tremendous depletion of these resources that the Native Americans had used for thousands of years. So this was devastating to Native Americans. Leah Brady is a retired school teacher and Shoshone historian who volunteers here regularly and advised the center on this exhibit. We, we heard a lot today about the immigrant experience crossing the California Trail. Of course, there are multiple experiences and perspectives on that. You can speak more to the Shoshone people and what it was like for them. What, what was that experience like? This was a spring gathering place where this area is. Most of the immigrants didn't even reach this area until August. And so a lot of them didn't experience the first immigrants that came through. But after you have a quarter million people coming through this area, they started to be more interactions with the people. The real skirmishes didn't start until after when the settlers actually stayed here. We're standing in front of a couple of murals depicting Native life back in the day. When you see them, do you feel like they got it right? Um, yeah, there's a couple errors, but I'm not gonna point them out. <laughs> there's more insight to the Shoshone lifestyle outside, where we see examples of Shoshone encampments. Former BLM archeologist Tim Murphy helped build these, and he's out maintaining them today. Hi, Tim. Hi. Thanks for coming out. Good to see you again. Thanks for coming out and meeting us here. What are we standing in? Well, we are standing in a uh, structure that was used by the Shoshone and other Great Basin peoples. This is a windbreak shelter, very temporary camp. As you can see, no roof on it, but it does provide some protection from the wind. This is if, if a family was only going to be in a place for a few days, they wouldn't uh, spend a lot of effort on, on building a shelter like this. When we constructed this, we were trying to show the different techniques of building that the Shoshone in this area might have used because the house type depends partially on the season and it also depends on what materials were available. This is a, another temporary shelter, maybe a week, two weeks here where they were planning to spend, maybe a little bit longer. But as you can see, this one has a sagebrush covering like the windbreak that we just came from. But this one is more of a teepee shaped. The framework on this one is juniper branches. So you just build a framework and you cover it with brush. This structure is a little bit different than the one we were just at. This one actually is more like the construction of a winter camp because it's got the overlapping willow branches and then grass mats put on the outside of it. And you, put, you start at the bottom and work your way up with the grass mat so it's like shingles and it drains the water off. So this, this one's more rainproof than that one is because the sagebrush protects you during a rainstorm but you still get sprinkles on you. <laughs> and then I've noticed that, that you've been using the grass inside the shelters as, would they have used it for bedding and for just kind of make it a little more comfortable? It depends, I mean sometimes people were on the dirt. I mean, of course, some of the original log cabins had dirt floors, you know, and, and people just lived with it. But other times they would put the grass down as a carpet, basically. Here we are looking at the, the final wiki up. Uh, wiki up is a generic term for uh, this kind of structure. It's basically a, a temporary shelter, usually on a frame, but it can have various coverings. Wikiups are used all across America. So how long would they have inhabited a shelter like this? They were probably thinking of at least a couple of weeks, if not a month, at a place like this. This one looks pretty well decked out. It's got grass carpet in it, this nice fur. Yeah. And you have other foodstuffs. Yeah, we've got various foodstuffs here. You know, we've got pine nuts, we've got bitterroot, arrow leaf, prickly pear, blue camas bulbs, 
some patties there and biscuits. And the biscuits could be toasted on top of the coals or in the coals. And then the other way of cooking is uh, you boil stuff. The Great Basin peoples as a whole were, were excellent basket makers. They could make almost watertight baskets, but you use what you call a hot rock lifting stick. And ordinarily I would uh, have a little brush here and I would brush the rock off before I dump it in, so. Ooh, listen to that. Oh, no kidding. It's funny, you, you know, we're so used to putting the heat to the water, it's so funny to put the heat inside the water. Right. Oh, and look at this sizzle. And our soup is going to be a little black, but again, that's <laughs> because I'm not. Uh... Oh, it just adds flavor, Tim. Oh, look boiling. at that, look at that, it's boiling water. You want a cup or a bowl? <laughs> and you know what? That boiled a lot faster than it does on the stove. I was gonna say, I think soup is done. Yep. Seeing these wagons up here reminds me, my great-great-grandmother, Emma Brown Kellogg, came across the California Trail in the late 1850s. She was about a 15 or 16 year old girl at the time and uh, she said they never, she never uh, rode in the wagon once, they were way too rough. And that she walked the entire distance with her father and brothers. We spent hours here and still didn't see it all. We look forward to a return visit to the center. But now it's time for us to follow the California Trail west for 70 miles to our destination for the night, Battle Mountain.